Good evening and welcome to the January 8, 2014 meeting of the Edina Planning Commission. My name is Kevin Staunton. I'm the chair of the commission. Jackie, could you please call the roll? Here. Here, thank you, Jackie. Uh, next on the agenda is approval of the meeting agenda. Are there any additions or modifications to the meeting agenda? Seeing none, I would take a motion to approve. So moved. Is any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same aye. sign. The meeting agenda is approved. Next up is the approval of the consent agenda. The only item on the consent agenda this evening is the minutes of the regular meeting of the Dyna Planning Commission from December 11, 2013. Are there any modifications to the minutes from the December 11 meeting? Seeing none, I would take a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye, opposed, same sign. The consent agenda is approved. Next up is community comment. This is the portion of the meeting dedicated to uh, members of the community who would like to comment on items that are not on this evening's agenda. And so if anyone in the audience uh, has something they'd like to share with us that's not on the agenda, this would be the time to come forward. Any takers? Looks like everybody's here for items on the agenda. So seeing no rush of people to community comment, I will take a motion to close community comment. In a second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Community comment is closed. Next up is public hearings. We have one item on the agenda for public hearings this evening. It is a variance for Devon George, 6600 Interlochen Boulevard, Edina, Minnesota. Chris, you'll take the lead on this? Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission, the subject property is located just north of Interlochen Boulevard and west of Green Farm Circle as highlighted. The uh, property is a single family home, two story with a three car attached garage as highlighted here. You can see the surrounding properties that are nearby. The request is for a 28.3 foot front yard setback variance to add on to the home. This is the home. Some of you may be familiar with it if you've driven down Interlochen Boulevard. It's been there since 1938. It predates all of the homes that are around it. It actually uh, dresses off of Interlochen Boulevard. The front of the house faces west, which is now a little strange because there's a cul-de-sac that's come in on the east side, which is Interlochen Circle, which you would typically think would be their front yard or front entrance. The front door of the house is actually facing west. This is the house that's directly to the north, which is along Interlochen Circle, and this house is affecting the setback along Interlochen Circle, which is the easterly property line of the subject property. And then this is the property that's directly to the west. This home fronts Interlochen Court and does not affect any of the setbacks of the subject property. This is a survey of the subject property. It's a little busy. The area that's highlighted in green is the existing footprint of the house. The areas that are highlighted in orange are the modifications to that footprint. Uh, the area here towards the front is actually going to be a new porch which uh, can overlap any setback area. Uh, the remainder of the modifications, which is actually tearing down the three-car garage, rebuilding it for a rec room with living space above, and then a three-car addition off the back of the house or towards the west. Um, all of those improvements are actually falling within the area where there's existing building footprint or are behind the required setback line, which is established by the house that is directly to the north, except for uh, the area that's cross-hatched here, 
which um, will match the existing setback from Green Farms Court. The house had been conforming for many years. Uh, the property uh, to the east was subdivided in 1986. The house to the north was built in 1998. It's actually 70 some feet back from the lot line. Uh, the minimum front yard setback is 30 feet. They chose to build the house much further back, which then, in effect, uh, made the subject property nonconforming. Now, the designer had been operating under the premise that if they modified these areas, that that wouldn't require any sort of variance because that's an um, area that's falling within the existing footprint area or behind the required setback, and that this area, because it's less than 200 square feet, would fall within our alternate setback rule. Unfortunately, um, there's no second floor above that existing garage, so all of that area does require a variance as well. And so that is why they're in front of the Planning Commission this evening, is to request a variance in order to uh, actually modify existing spaces, rebuild, and add a small addition to the, what will be now the front of the house um, at the existing non-conforming setback that the house um, has right now. This is the new floor plan of the house. The area in question that's actually the new portion is uh, a dining area off of the kitchen and then on the second floor, a bedroom area. Um, this would be area above the rebuilt garage, which would now be a rec room. And then the area above the new three car garage, which is a master bedroom, which falls then behind the setback requirement. This is the new east elevation. They will be introducing a door. Uh, so the front facing portion of the house will now be towards Green Farm Circle. And then the new north elevation of the house, which actually be further away from the north property uh, than the current garage is right now. So the setback along the north side that is actually affecting the property to the north that sets up the setback requirement um, will be further away from the north property line with the new addition. This is the new westerly elevation, which currently is the front of the house, um, which will now be more or less the back elevation. And then a new uh, south elevation with the garage doors facing interlocking directly off of, loading directly off of interlocking. Uh, here's a photograph of the house as it exists today, a west elevation of the house. It's facing west and then east elevation and another east elevation of the house as it exists today. What will happen is the, the porch will be rebuilt. There will be a new front entry porch uh, with a new doorway, new dining area, informal dining area, living space above and then the garage area and master bedroom behind. There have been no permits issued on this property um, with the exception of some permits associated with the old septic system. So um, there, the, the house is in dire need of um, attention and that is exactly what the new property owner intends to do. Um, I was a little uh, surprised that they're going to be adding on to the house. It was certainly a candidate for removal. Um, it, is, it is in pretty poor shape. Staff does believe that there are um, extenuating circumstances that would support a variance request, that the circumstances are unique to the property and not self-imposed. Obviously, the house was conforming for many years. It was built in 1938 um, as a result of the subdivision that came in on the east side and the location of the house to the north. They are now subjected to this uh, front yard setback that cuts through the existing home. Uh, staff does support the request. Um, approval of the variance should be subject to uh, the conditions that the home must be constructed per the proposed plans, date stamped December 20th, 2013. And with that, I will stop and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chris. Any questions for Ms. Ocker? Thanks, Chris. Would the applicant uh, like to come up and say a few words about the project? I 
I think you're going to find that the side microphones work better than the middle one. Hello, everyone. I'm Devin George, and um, I am Mr. the George. owner of this home, and um, I plan to remodel it. Um, the bones of the building of the home is in very good condition. Um, it just has some asbestos problems and lead um, due to it being built so far uh, so long ago. Um, but that is basically she summed it up on what I'm trying to do is just add more living space. Um, I have two small children, um, and we need a little bit more space than the size of the house right now. Um, I'm a little taller than normal, and so the 1938 home is a little bit uh, cramped for me, but um, I love the area, um, great neighborhood. Um, I'm a Minnesota native, and so uh, that's about it. So I appreciate it. I'm not sure why, uh, what happened, but the neighbor to the north, um, they had gotten contact with me too, and they were actually going to show up too if there was any problems, but they are in support of what I'm doing as well. Yeah, so. we did get something on our, is that the uh, Hogan's on 4931? Um, they sent a letter in support of your application. So okay. maybe that's a different neighbor. Is that the neighbor you're? Is it, um, Green Farms. That's, they are that's the neighbor to the across the street that's looking at it. They came in and looked at oh, the plans. Oh, okay. So to the no, to the, the east, the, directly east across the the Hogan's. Okay. No, the Jean and um, I forgot their name, but it's the, the 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 home that you showed on there, the first one. They uh, those is that who you're talking about? No, I think this is the one across Green Farms from oh, okay. your house. And then there's one to the north that I think you're talking this about. This is Mr. the George. one that they were going to come today. Okay. If, if right. need be, they said to show up. They, were gonna, they would be here So okay. if there was a problem or issues. Any questions for Mr. George? Anything else you want to share with us about the project? Um, that's it. We are uh, just plan on blending in with the neighbor. Yeah. Um, the uh, outside it will be... Um, uh, hardy or, or uh, LP siding or and then the roof will be sheeter, uh, cedar um, and, and that's about it we'll do some brick and some stone that we showed on the plans but everything will be as they are in the plans all right very good that's about it thank you thank you uh, this is a public hearing so if there are any members of the public who would like to come forward and comment on this application now is the time Seeing no rush to the podium, I'd take a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. All right. Uh, we'll bring the discussion up to the Planning Commission comments or discussion on this application. It's a slow to warm up crowd tonight. Commissioner Grable. Well, this is one of those situations where something that has happened uh, long since the house was built uh, creates an issue for the uh, applicant, and it uh, seems to me that the request is certainly justified. Commissioner Scherer. I'd, I'd also like to add that I'm, I'm thrilled it's not a teardown. I'm thrilled you're blending in with the neighborhood and working to enhance the home to meet your needs. I, that pleases me a lot, and I appreciate your effort and applaud your effort in that regard. I think that's terrific. <laughs> so I'm in, I'm in favor of it. I, I think the existing conditions would warrant uh, in, uh, voting in favor of this. Yeah, I, um, I would echo Commissioner Scherer's comments. It's nice to have somebody taking the effort to preserve something that really has a lot of character in that neighborhood and, and obviously was one of the first places up there. So kudos to you on that. Further discussion? I would, uh, Commissioner Forrest. I move approval of the variance for the 28.3 foot front yard setback. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Congratulations. Good luck. All right, the next item on the agenda, the next section is reports and recommendations. The first item in reports and recommendations is a sketch plan for Taco Bell. 
at 3210 Southdale Circle. Carry. Thank you, Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, before you, as mentioned, is a sketch plan review where the Planning Commission is asked to make non-binding uh, comments on an application that will be uh, coming in the near future. What they'll be uh, proposing here is uh, tear down the existing building, build a new one, and so they would come forward at a later date with a site plan application with some variances. And we'll go through those here in a second. So this property is located just south of 66th Street on the east side of York, um, <clears throat> near Southdale. This is an aerial shot of the existing Taco Bell store, uh, just north of the McDonald's. Um, as you can see, there is a drive-through in the back of the building that faces um, single-family residential homes here to the east. Um, our, it, it appears that, or at least our records that we have, the building was built in 1972 as a Zapata restaurant. In 1985, when it was a Zantigo restaurant, they received a variance to expand the parking, um, the parking spaces, and the variance that they received was for a three-foot setback to match the existing. So when the original building was built, um, there's no record of a review, so it was a non-conforming use, so they were expanding that non-conformity. The proposal before you is to tear down that existing building and build a new Taco Bell. Um, some renderings here, I'll let the applicant go through in a little more detail, um, but it would be an EFIS type uh, construction with some masonry and metal uh, accent panels. The restaurant itself would be slightly smaller than the existing uh, restaurant. So this is a footprint that has been laid over the existing structure. So you can see it's a, a square building now, and it would be more uh, rectangular shaped. Um, they are proposing to maintain that same pattern for the drive through around the building, and generally the same uh, area for parking. They would eliminate this row of parking in the back. So the red dashed line indicates the required setbacks of 35 feet. So the building itself would extend into the required setback um, where they would seek a variance. The parking setback requirement is 10 feet. They're proposing four feet here. And again, the existing condition is a three foot setback. Uh, it would be landscaped around the perimeter and they've, they've shown enough uh, overstory trees that would conform to our code. So just to quickly show you the, um, <clears throat> the proposed building versus our um, zoning district standards. So again, that front yard setback variance would be needed for an 18-foot setback, the parking aisle setback of 4 feet. The number of parking stalls they're proposing here is 16. Based on the uh, number of seats that they're anticipating, they would need 19, so they're a little bit short there. Variance would be required, so we'd require a parking study to... Uh, uh, to verify that, <clears throat> or, uh, or uh, take a look at uh, proof of parking potentially. And lastly, our code requires any menu board or audio system. Um, it, the code states that it can't face a single family residential area, or that's, it can't be located on the side of a building that faces uh, residential property. And as we indicated, the existing condition faces that residential property to the east. What they're doing to try to address that is angle the, uh, the PA system to face toward the south, this location here. But nonetheless, it is still located on that side of the building, so it would require a variance. So with that, I can stop and answer any questions that you may have. The applicant is here, and uh, we'll have a presentation as well. Thank you, Kerry. Questions for Mr. T. Commissioner Grable. Kerry, two questions. One, the... Uh... I gather that the houses that are behind are uh, within the city of Edina. Does the, the, the property, the city boundary go down the middle of the street? Correct. Okay. And then the second question, could you go to the, uh, the picture about the parking, <coughs> the parking setback? I'm not, I'm having trouble understanding what is required there. So along the side lot lines, a 10-foot 
setback is required. So a green space separation between the lot line and the parking stalls um, requires a 10 foot setback. They're proposing a four foot setback. Um, so if, so if, if they were to, uh, if they were to comply with the ordinance, then the parking stalls would have to be on the north side of that 10 foot dotted line. Is that right? That's correct. But the property next door is the McDonald's and there's parking all along that side. Correct. Commissioner Forrest and then Commissioner Shearer. I had a couple questions. One is I'm having trouble finding 16 spaces indicated on the plan here. I'm only counting 14, so I'm missing something somewhere. There are 14 shown there. And then my other question was, um, in the um, table that you provided, you said that on the east side that there's a 20-foot uh, setback requirement that they comply with, but on the drawings it looks like it's, it's indicated as 18 feet between the drive aisle and the, you can see it right above that arrow thing. And it's the same on the other drawings as well. Uh, the 18 feet here is just indicating the drive aisle. The 15 foot setback is, this is the lot line right here. Okay. So there's 15 feet between the lot line and the paved surface here. Okay, so the, the 20 feet that you have there, where, where is that measured from then? The 20 foot requirement, that's in the front. Um, so that would be right here. From a front lot line or a street uh, right of way line, a 20 foot setback is required, so that's this distance here. Okay, because here it says east is 20 feet, so maybe those got reversed? That's quite possible. Is, okay, and west is 10 feet, so what, the 10 feet would be on the rear lot line? Correct. Okay, thanks. So just to go through what Commissioner Forrest had identified, there's along the south lot line, there's 10 spaces, and then four along the north lot line? Right. We don't know where the other two are, so we can ask the applicant when they come forward. Commissioner Shear. Carrie, I just wanted to clarify a, a few things about the audio system. You, leaving this drawing up that you have, show me where the audio system is proposed now to be located. I believe it's right. Maybe this graphic shows it a is little bit. Is it the better. box adjacent to car number four? Yes, it would be right here. So it's, and, and, and show me where the houses are? Right here. So it's angled. It's partly it's against angled. the McDonald parking lot and partly towards the houses. Correct. Okay. Um, and they've moved it here from a place that they had originally intended to put it? Well. Is that what you were saying earlier? Yeah, this was in an effort to, because of our ordinance that, mm -hmm. that says it can't be on this side of the building. Um, they haven't moved it to a different side of the building, but at least they're angling it away to try to minimize those impacts to the residents. It still will require a variance. Has there been any discussion about just moving it right around the corner so that it's facing McDonald's? It would, it would be a good question for the applicant. Can they, can they do that? We've had some discussion about, you know, have they tried to look at options that are code compliant? Mm -hmm. um, but Which I believe would be consistent with the direction the McDonald's audio sign is. Right. Right, to the south. Yeah, I believe that's on the south side of the building. Right. right. Okay. Thank much you larger much. site, McDonald's. That's a little more land to work yeah. with. But Thank you. Other questions for Carrie? All right. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so, by process of elimination, I'm assuming you're the applicants. <laughs> or you're waiting to comment on our subdivision ordinance. <laughs> Mr. Chair, <laughs> members of the commission, yes, I am the applicant. My name is Barbara Schneider. Welcome, uh, Ms. Schneider. Good evening. My address is 1743 Skater Drive in Egan, Minnesota. I'm here on behalf of Border Foods, who is the Taco Bell franchisee. Uh, our office is in Golden Valley. Uh, unlike uh, this, this is a very old restaurant, and we'd really like to modernize the restaurant. We think that would be in the spirit in keeping with the city of Edina. Hopefully the Edina residents would be supportive of that as well. 
Um, if I could start with the last question first, Mr. Chair, and answer that about the location sure. of the menu board. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner, the menu board is currently located directly in back of the building. Mm -hmm. It is 100% facing the fence of the, that is along the property line at this, at this point. Our effort to relocate it, um, there were some decisions in the design element that we had to, to kind of work on. Uh, and I understand that variances are never really acceptable to anyone, but although I have never um, um, heard from the neighbors directly behind us with any sort of complaint, I wanted to try to get the building as far forward as I possibly could, knowing that that would encroach on the setback. And if you look at the buildable area of the parcel, we probably have less than 25% of the current parcel to work with to jockey everything that we need. And so I, I tried to prioritize in deference to the neighbors, to the residential neighbors, not my commercial neighbors, that moving forward was something that I could do which would allow us then to build some additional landscaping buffer in the back um, to, to mitigate noise. Um, we did talk about uh, placing this, this, the audio portion and the menu board more on the what would be the south side of the building right around the corner but I want to make sure that we meet the fire code with the uh, roof access ladder and those types of things there. We do believe that we can angle the board and we do believe that the majority of the board and the audio system would face our, our commercial neighbors and we tried to demonstrate that on our drawing that we've, that we've given you today. Uh, so that was the first question. Thank you. On the second question, Mr. Chair, where are the other two parking places? it would appear that our brains are frozen and that there are only 14, and I apologize for that. That's why there's nine of us here. Only, <laughs> only one of us got it. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of hoo-ha going on in the site plan here, and when you get so much, it's, you sometimes lose a little bit of it. Um, so does that mean you're going to go with 14 instead of 19, or are you going to try and figure out how uh, to get to 16 I, instead of 19? We would go back again and, and look and see what we can, we can do. My guess is that it's probably really 14 as I'm standing in front of okay. you this evening. Um, I don't, um, I don't recall any other specific questions. My architect is here, and he'd be happy to take you through the building materials if you're interested in, in that type of discussion, or if there is a specific question that you can refresh my memory on here. Well, I don't recall any other questions, Ms. Schneider. This is a sketch plan mm -hmm. review, and we appreciate you taking advantage of this um, voluntary part of our code to come in. What we really try to do in this is have a back and forth um, at a place where you aren't so wedded to your design that you can't uh, sure. that you can't make some changes, and so that's kind of the spirit of our um, our sketch plan process. And with that, I'd ask if there's any questions or comments from the commission for Ms. Schneider on this, Commissioner Fisher. I would just like to uh, understand a little bit what's happening in the taco business um, in terms of uh, this this strikes me as really interesting you know not that long ago we approved a Starbucks which is about this shape and it's about the cars moving around the building and is that where it's going I mean the fact that you're not concerned about parking spaces which I think 10 years ago we would have been talking about parking spaces more than the drive-through so what's happening there is it is that what everyone does they just drive around and pick it up and uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner, uh, drive-through convenience is very important to the service industry, and um, part of it is land availability. Uh, <clears throat> part of it is just the convenience. 
uh, and in weather conditions like we had the last few days, which are certainly extreme. But s somehow moms taking their kids out of the cars, everybody feels safer in their vehicles now. And it does represent a large portion of the QSR business, whether it be Starbucks, uh, coffee, I can't speak to them, but certainly in our business, convenience, car convenience is very important. What, if you know, or maybe Carrie, what's going on to the site to the north? Is it vacant? Is, it, is there any action anticipated? Nothing anticipated. We've had a lot of inquiries, but nothing has resulted in anybody moving into the existing space or any additions. So right now, all quiet with that site. So, I mean, one of the, as a planning commissioner, one of the things that really occurs to me as I look at, at the aerial map of this area is, I don't know who laid it out, <laughs> for starters. You know, you've got this goofy little Southdale circle <laughs> wrapped around some site. You've got residential properties behind you. you. Obviously, the Best Buy site is in transition McDonald's appears to be thriving. It sounds like you're thriving enough to be able to invest in more. But I wonder about the long range, um, you know, where this little area is, is headed, whether those houses will continue to be there in, in the back. I know we've had, um, we've had a, a sketch plan in front of us for a property two doors to the south of you um, that includes some of the residential properties on Xerxes. Um, any thoughts about kind of why you're making the decision to invest long term in the in this little corner? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, I received a call probably 18 months ago or so about the Best Buy parcel being redeveloped and would we be interested in participation if there was mm -hmm. something that changed? I said we would. Uh, I followed up on the call several times. Um, I d never received any sort of definite response back. Uh, and I guess we're to the point that we feel that time marches on sure. and we'd like, we'd like to move ahead with our business and and we're, so if there was going to be we're uncertain of the future. Sure. We, we, we're trying to control, sir, what we can control. Fair enough. I mean, if there's going to be a big transition, it sounds like you might have had an open mind about that, but there's a time when mm -hmm. you got to move on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Grable. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it's interesting that you, you are moving the building as far to the front as you're able to, I assume that the building design is uh, probably controlled somewhat by uh, Taco Bell corporate. I would think they do have design standards for their restaurants. I suppose is that uh, right, Mr. Chair, Commissioner? Yes, we are. We are um, managed very carefully. Okay. Uh, well, I appreciate that you moving it forward. I, I'm looking at the parcel across <coughs> directly to the west. Uh, and that certainly seems to be uh, very close to the street um, uh, on the north side of that building. I'm a little, I'm intrigued, Carrie, and maybe you can answer this. Do you know when this area was platted? Uh, was the uh, commercial area in place at the time the residential lots were platted? It, it's just, it's, it's unusual in the city of Edina to have an R1 district next to anything other than an R2 or another R1. And that creates some problems for uh, the commercial areas because the commercial areas want to do their thing and then, and then they have to worry about uh, the neighbors. We had that situation with uh, the company I work for. It's an industrial facility next to an R1 district and uh, it just, it's not good planning. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're right. That is uh, very unusual for Edina, especially a, a higher-density commercial 
district adjacent to single family residential. You know, we have some neighborhood commercial uh, nodes, uh, but I, I don't know the timing of these plats. That's something I could could do some research on and see which did come first. I'm yeah, it would, sure. it would be interesting to know which came first and, you know, what the thinking was when they did it, why why they would have the R1 next to this uh, more intense use. So, um, but anyway, I you know, just if you can figure out the parking, uh, it, I think it's always good to uh, to improve an area with uh, new facilities. Commissioner Schroeder. I have a question about the orientation of the order board and the stacking. I must, you mentioned Taco Bell corporate has requirements for franchisees for architecture. Do they also have requirements for stacking distance in advance of the um, ordering station? And it, maybe it's not important to look at that tonight, but as we, as you get into possibly the need to do a traffic study, a parking study, we may also be asking you to look at how much stacking and how fast things go through because the fallback for this, for people who can't get through the ordering station fast enough, is to move out onto the street, which we would probably not want to have. So that's one of the concerns. And I'll, I'll ask my second question. I guess this is probably more directed towards staff, but uh, Carrie, I thought that in a PCD3 district, relative to the front yard setback, we could grant them leniency for a pedestrian oriented, for a, a, a facility that actually opened up to the street. And it appears that this building does open up to the street and they would actually be allowed a zero foot setback and not the requirement that's stated in the report. You're correct. We could certainly do that. There is the language that suggests moving the buildings up to the street. So we could even go further than what's proposed here. It still requires a variance, but the code is open to that. Um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, uh, yes, Taco Bell likes the menu board at the fifth vehicle. Um, however, um, you know, sometimes I have discussions with them, and this is an extenuating circumstance where moving the menu board to me is probably one of the um, higher priority items that we can do in, in respect to the neighbors behind us. Mr. Chair, can I follow up on that? Please. And, and the reason I was trying to tie these two things together, if the building is pulled more forward, you could actually take the menu board from its current location on the southeast side and move it around to the northeast side where it's more directed towards the back of the former Best Buy and only kind of towards one residential home instead of the several that are more towards the south. And you might actually achieve your five stacking distances, st five car stacking distance, by pulling the building forward. Um, just some, I mean, trying to tie the two things together. Sure. Um, um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner, we'll take a look at that. Um, we have the transformer that we need to, to locate back in, in the rear. And, and so I think it's a matter of physical constraints and space back there that, that we're dealing with. And, and um, but, we'll, but we'll certainly take a look at that. Ms. Schneider, can you tell me a little bit more about what you're planning or what you're thinking in terms of the buffer? I, I heard in the discussion that there's a fence currently there between you and the residential properties behind, but would that stay, would that be replaced? And then I know you're talking about some foliage, trees, et cetera. Can you just elaborate uh, on that a little bit, what you're thinking? Um, Mr. Chair, commissioners, the fence would stay. Um, there is enough room for us to put some uh, large uh, spruce trees, which I think can become pretty dense to create some buffer back there. Uh, there's a fairly steep drop off at the back property line right now, but I'm, I'm confident that uh, our civil engineer looked at that and he thought that could be filled in so that we could accomplish the landscaping. Drop off on your property. Drop off on our side. Okay. Drop off on ours. There are there, as I recall. There are trees, but they are deciduous trees as opposed to a spruce dense dense tree. And I believe the majority of them are on the resident side of the of the property line, on their property. So then, the one other thing that I'm thinking about is just. 
this whole traffic with the Southdale Circle because that's just that's a right in right out, right? I mean, you can't can't take a left turn on to um, York I, over there, can you? M Mr. Chair, and it was dark this evening, and the mind's a little fuzzy tonight, but uh, I do believe that if you use the southwest side of the horseshoe, that you can make a left turn, I think, out on York. Wow. I think. Because I just drove by there tonight, too, Yeah, coming, you, coming a, from the south, and wow. Yeah. Other, if other, you can, I'm not sure you'd want to. I, that is that is correct. <laughs> I mean, the the circle does function as mostly a right mostly in, right, in, right out. out. So when your customers, I mean, you got to be coming from the south to get to your business, Mr. Chair. That's correct. So if you want, you want a taco, no. and you're going west on. Uh, <laughs> you can left in. Oh, can you left in? South on York, you can left turn in on, on the... You can't. But you can come in from either direction. Oh, okay. So you can... So, if, so you can come in... If you're going down, York. you're going east on 66 and you get a sudden hanker and you can take a right on York and a left into Southdale Circle and get there. There's a left turn okay. access there that takes you into Southdale Circle. Oh, you're right. Now that you mentioned yeah. All right, I remember that. All right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, for refreshing my memory. <laughs> well, it's just a tough... It's a, it's a it's, tough, tough little I traffic know area. I know when I used to patronize the Best Buy, if you get yourself turned around the wrong way, you had to go all the way around the block to get back there. So, Other questions or comments? Commissioner Forrest. So you're looking at a, an entry door on the front of the building as well as on the south side, is that? I'm sorry, ma'am, could you? Re uh, the entry doors, are they on the south side and the front of the building on the west, or? Uh, the. The entry door is placed on the, um, let me get my directions, uh, on the, there's one on the entry on the south side uh -huh. of the building, and there can be one on the north, on the, I'm sorry, the west side of the building, depending upon what city code is. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. I guess, since it's a sketch plan review, I'll just talk about things that we've been concerned about in the past. We've had um, commissioners who've been concerned about the idling of cars in, um, <clears throat> drive-through lanes that are adjacent to residential areas. That's a, it has been a concern in the past. I mean, this is not a new um, situation, though, for this property either. I will grant that. And where's my notes? There was one other thing. Um, but I, yeah, I guess I would be in favor of whatever you can do to... Um, make it more comfortable for the neighbors, whether it's moving the building further forward on the lot or however the um, audio board can be arranged to best um, complement the neighborhood rather than detract from it. Commissioner Platter. So I have two questions. One actually is more for staff. So is there any reason you'd build a sidewalk in this area on the front here? I mean, would, it, would you ever have a chance of going anywhere with it or? I suppose it depends what happens to that property in the north. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, I don't, I, big push to have sidewalks where we can and, you know, we're never, we're going to have some orphans for a while. Um, Is there a sidewalk on Xerxes in front of those residential properties on the Dinosite? I'm not sure. No, there's, no, there's not one behind. You mean behind? Yeah, those residential ones. There's not one behind Kevin, I assume. Yeah, probably. There's not one going okay. I can't really tell. Yeah, I'm not, it, there's no sidewalks shown on that area that's provided in the packet, so where that ends, I'm not sure. All right, sorry, Commissioner Platter, I jumped in before you got to your second. So my other question, and, and uh, kind of back to the point of, of being closer to the street, are you planning any kind of uh, seating area or, um, you know, it's not the, obviously the best place to probably sit, but are, are you 
doing some type of patio out there too. You know, if you do move the building forward, you still have room for something like that in the front. Um, what Mr. was your thoughts? Mr. Chair, commissioners, no, we are not planning any outside seating at the restaurant. Commissioner Halpa. Um, I'm not really sure if this is a new idea or not, but I, I think it's possible to have like two menu boards um, and have the one menu board and the audio system facing north and have another one facing south. And I don't think maybe that would disrupt the residents as much. And it would give time for the cars in the drive through lane to decide what they want before they get up to the audio system that is facing north. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense, but I was thinking it might be helpful to have two. So, uh, Mr. Chair, um, s commissioners, so you're you're talking about a a a preview board of such is is yeah. that? Yeah, that one facing south. And uh, the preview board would be without an audio system. Yeah. Further back towards the circle. Um. I, I think, I was thinking more where it is. Yeah, where, like the preview board, where you're thinking it would be right now. And then um, the audio system with the actual menu board um, on the northeast side facing where the Best Buy used to be. So on both corners. Mm -hmm. Where you're thinking where the transformer is, uh, shown on page A7. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So would right. so would that be in the way then? No. Could we I mean, if you put the board there. Yeah. We, Miss Mr. Chair, we can certainly take a look at that, but we're getting uh, we're we're getting tight on that corner, and yeah. and the other piece that you have to kind of keep in mind is. We need to make sure that the radiuses are comfortable enough mm -hmm. for turning movements so that they're not uh, hitting the building, although every year we seem to have about four or five buildings that <laughs> get uh, a little tagged. <laughs> but, well, I think, but, but, I think you're detecting a theme here on the menu board, and it sounds like you've been on the issue to start with. Uh, yeah, anything it, we can do to get the get especially the sound and the light kind of pointed away from the yes. residential area is is a winner sure and sure. Ha however creative you know you've heard some good ideas from folks about different well, ways we'll, to maybe think about that we'll see how creative we can be okay commissioner sure um, I don't know exactly how all my fellow commissioners will weigh in on this, but I would volunteer that uh, with regard to the uh, proposed variances on the uh, parking, on the uh, particularly the, uh, well, both the north and south side, the four feet, I personally, given that you've been at an existing three feet, given where the McDonald's parking is, that's a non-issue to me. I, 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 I would grant that in an instant. I, I wouldn't worry about that. I, I'm, I'm a little less clear about your, the parking habits of your customers and whether 14 slots will be adequate. Um, and, and that would be something, you know, in your next presentation for there to be a little more analysis of, I think, to make us comfortable with that, that question, the 14 versus 19. Uh, we, we have talked periodically from this podium about the fact that our current code can cause over-parking requirements. Uh, too, too many spaces to be held. So I wouldn't want to hold you to that. And, and as uh, Commissioner Fisher was discussing earlier, you know, if the, if the current trend is that you've got much heavier volume in drive-through as opposed to people parking or coming into your restaurant, using you as a sit-down restaurant, th those are things that I'm sure you've done marketing studies on. And I'm sure that's something we'll want to hear about in a final presentation so that we can become comfortable with the 14 slot request. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Please. Um, what would the commission think about keeping the existing parking the way it is? And maintaining the fence and not creating the additional landscape screening, but moving the menu board uh, 
further around the corner. So if I move on, on picture A7, if I move the menu board to the right of the word service entry and kept the parking the way it is on this overhead that you see, how would the commission feel about that? And it, would you have to move the building further forward? Because um, it looks like you might have trouble accessing the spaces that are adjacent to the residential properties on the east. Well, we would be... Yeah. Which just looks a little tight. I suppose you'll have to, you'd have to engineer how you, how much space you need there. Code-wise, we need 14 feet through there. Okay. Commissioner Schroeder. The, the, the question we're wrestling with is, to begin with, is 19 spaces even the correct amount of parking spaces that we need here? Right. Our code was probably created a long time ago. Right. And I contend that for a use like this, if somebody comes here and can't find a parking space and they're looking for fast food, they're going to just keep driving until they find another one, maybe right to the south. They're not going to be trying to find a parking space on the street. They're not going to be not driving to. around the block until a space opens. Um, they're going to just move on. So I think the question we should be wrestling with, and maybe we get back to the proponent, is to prove to us that 14 spaces might actually be the right, maybe 12 spaces is the right number. Have them tell us that. Well, Commissioner Grable. I agree with Commissioner Schroeder. So we do agree every, every now and then. <laughs> it's twice this year, I think. Uh, I agree with that, and as far as your question, I would rather see, uh, you know, convince us that 14 is enough uh, and do the uh, spruce trees along the back and do the buffer. I think that's a better solution than filling up a space with parking spaces. Well, and generally our interest in, in making sure there's enough off-street parking is that you're not going somewhere else to park. And so, especially in a mixed neighborhood, we'd worry about parking in the residential portion of the neighborhood. Well, they're not going to be able to get there from here. And I think Commissioner Schroeder makes a good point about um, they're not likely to stay if they can't find parking or find drive through space. And I've always thought that the stakes are much higher for the business than they are for the city. I mean, you don't want to underpark it. it. That's customers who could potentially go away. So you've certainly got an interest in making sure you have the right number of spaces. Okay. Uh, Mr. Teague. Could I uh, <clears throat> answer the sidewalk question? We've done some Google Earth here, and I've got some answers. Excellent. The miracles of modern technology. Okay, that's working. So there are, <laughs> there are a lot more sidewalks out here than we thought. There is a sidewalk, it, it's, it abuts up against the curb along York, but it does go all the way along York and to 66th and to this point here, and there is a sidewalk on the Richfield side of Xerxes. Uh -huh. So the issue of making this pedestrian oriented somewhat does make some sense to get people along Southdale Circle out to the sidewalk here. We may want to, as these properties redevelop along York, <clears throat> pull that off of the curb and have that boulevard style sidewalk, but um, there is some sidewalks in the area. Thank you, Carrie. Commissioner Platter. So I'd like to see a sidewalk there. <laughs> you know, it may not go very far right now, but to start the, start the piece, and especially if that Best Buy parcel comes up, that would make a natural connection out to the, um, the other sidewalk as well. And the other portion is that down the street, and in, in theory there's been for sketch plan, or be out on how many residences are planned just about a block down the street, so there's potential for a lot of customers coming along there. Uh, right. The other thing I was going to say, though, is in what I would like to see is I would agree with Commissioner Grable and uh, Schroeder on 
keeping the spruce in back and more of that barrier because I believe it looks like you're you're uh, taking some asphalt and making it uh, pervious surface at that chance and and uh, I would also ask do you need 18 feet for the drive aisle behind the behind the store and I don't know if that's a mandate or you know kind of on both sides if you truly need that if you don't have parking stalls to get through could you even you know bring that up a little bit more and you know maybe strip off another four feet there to uh, go back to pervious surface as well if yeah, 14 feet is the code requirement for one way so they can so it would like to see that 14 feet back there in other words minimize it and, and get as much uh, unpaved surface back as we could here Commissioner Forrest well, and we do have the Southdale Apartments going in Kitty Corner from that intersection on that intersection of um, York and 66 as well. So you may find there is more potential for foot traffic because of that too. So I think anything that can be done to make that attractive and forward-looking yeah. would be great. Well, and the sketch plan is two doors to the south. Was the we don't know if that's going to happen, but. There's folks tinkering with uh, putting residential in in that area, two doors to your south. Okay. Yeah, I think I hear a, a consensus for um, being um, flexible on the parking if we can if if we can create a little more buffer and a little more green space in the back sure. for the residential neighbors behind you. All right. Anything else? Ms. Schneider, I want to, uh, Commissioner Fisher. I'm just out of curiosity, if when you do projects like this where you're scraping something and rebuilding, what's how do you do that? What's the downtime you normally have? And uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, if we if my team has completed our jobs well and we plan properly, we can get her down and up in about 90 days. Really. Mm -hmm. The reason I ask, I have three teenagers in my house. <clears throat> this has now gotten more interest than in all the nine years I've been on the planning commission. <laughs> this is the one they, they actually cared about amazingly. It's, uh, I, I like to think that the construction timeline that we have is how well we've planned the project and, and completed our due diligence. So. Well, I, I want to thank you for taking advantage of the sketch plan process. We think it's a nice opportunity to have some informal discussion at the front end. And thank you. Appreciate your ideas and hope you'll take ours uh, into your thinking process as you move forward. Commissioner, uh, chairs, th thank you very much. All right. All right, so the next item on the agenda, uh, we have two other items under reports and recommendations. Um, the first of which is discussion on a proposed tree preservation ordinance. I want to compliment uh, Commissioners Carr and Platter for taking the initiative to, uh, to pull something together on the tree preservation ordinance, which we've been talking about for quite some time and is part of our 2014 work plan. And I think um, maybe, Mike, I'll ask you to, to just give a brief overview of kind of what you were trying to accomplish here and then Carrie I know you have gone through this with staff and you had some comments on your memo as well and so if you can then give us some of that and then we can have some discussion be great sure I can give you a little background to what what we're thinking with this uh, part of it is especially with all the teardowns going around uh, especially in my neighborhood in particular Morningside it seems when, when they're coming in, they're really taking big holes out of the tree canopy. Um, the, a lot of these lots are really getting, they, they essentially get clear cut when, they're, when uh, somebody comes in, and that's probably for a lot of reasons. Uh, one that I'm thinking is it's easier to build, you don't have to deal with um, trying to work around trees. Having said all that, and there's enough places going in, will be that you know, it's very noticeable in, in per some particular places that the trees are all gone now. And I also assume that a lot of people want to live there because of the trees in particular in tree-lined streets, but every new house that comes in is, is taking another swath out of that. So really it's about addressing what happens with teardowns and rebuilds and what remains there on site. So 
it's it's getting at where the trees are it would it would require some type of um, survey of what's there uh, we define what protected trees are uh, it defines that if you do take a protected pr protected tree down you'd have to replace it with two other ones um, it defines how to protect them during construction and that kind of references back to our construction management plan which I believe there's a piece in there about it uh, so it's really about trying to keep the larger um, mature um, good trees around and have some some type of ordinance that addresses that versus you know I've seen a couple come in here and asked about what's going to happen with the trees yeah they'll remain or they say well you don't have any ordinance against something so they just kind of all go away so this is meant to address that you know I'm sure there's uh, opportunities within this it's not going to maybe address as much as some people want but it is a start and as a way to start addressing this issue for for all these teardowns that go on so that's kind of the the genesis behind it and i'm certainly open to any questions or comments as we go through this yes well i'm looking at the um i think it's section 2b the removable trees how, how did we arrive at the definition of which varieties would be viewed as removable trees that was through some research. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention we looked at about six or eight other city codes for this, and that was one of the items in there. I also did some research with uh, um, the state website just on how they define trees mm -hmm. and, and what goes on. So it was all captured from those pieces. And so that's kind of the definitions. I actually would, would also uh, bring forth a change to that and essentially saying if it's if it's not listed as a protected tree, that it would be a removable tree versus just listing these out. I mean, we would list them out, but in addition to that, it would say if it's not in the protected, it would be in the removal piece for that. Okay. I'm not an arborist, but there are a few varieties on the removable list that I can think of some pretty attractive large versions of those in my neighborhood that I wouldn't want just hacked down. Yeah, so and that's, I don't and know. that's part of the discussion. So it was really <laughs> meant, it was, it was meant around trees that have a tendency to um, either not survive or be much shorter lifespan shorter life well not necessarily shorter lifespan but trees that um, have a better chance of failing I guess maybe a better word or uh, I mean I clearly more understand easier for ash it to be torn down or and ash ash unfortunately because of the uh, emerald just, ash it borer. is what it is yeah. yeah I mean obviously I I've got two in my yard I'm sure hoping they don't go away but with the ash borer that's a, a piece of that 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 why that one's in there so obviously like buckthorn and and uh, aspen or poplar you know trees that that are that tend to uh, fail earlier and maybe aren't the you know the large stronger trees like an oak or a maple okay just curious how we arrived at the yeah so that, that's how we got to that now again this is open for discussion if you have a particular that you love cottonwoods you know that's, that's maybe <laughs> something to, to look at no just trying to understand how we arrived at that yeah. selection. That's how. Um, Carrie, maybe while we're kind of noodling on this, can you walk us through what you've done from a staff level and the, some of the questions you've raised in your memo? Certainly, we've uh, <laughs> circulated the ordinance through uh, staff, and so what's in the memo here is kind of a summary of the, the issues that have come up. Um, the first is just simply staffing and enforcing the ordinance. Our city forester is a part-time position. Not saying this couldn't work because some of these things, responsibilities, you know, could they, like the, uh, the monitoring three years after a, a new home is built, you know, that maybe that could morph into some of the Cindy's position where she's out and about and could check that out. But just something that we need to take into consideration. Um, yeah, my, Carrie, my thought too on that for... When the survey comes in, I would think that'd be something your department could address, right, when the survey comes in. If the tree survey comes in as part of the land development permit, that would be really on your desk to look at and see what's there and see if this applies, right, versus the forester. Right, initially yeah. it would be reviewed by the planners in our in our yeah. department as part so of So that would take permit. some of that off the yep. potential of the forester there. Yeah, it was more, I think, the concerns I heard were once the permits issued and the trees have been planted it's that monitoring for the first three years 
Um, the two for one replacement, we just raised that. Is that too much? I, we don't have any data to say that's too much or too little or whatever, but um, several raised that issue. Uh, the part of the reason, I just say part of the reason is two for one because we, you know, ideally you'd want to save the tree that's there. So if you're going to remove it, there's, I wouldn't say a penalty, but there's there's more than just a one for one to, to replace it at that point. And it's going to take a while for it to get back to that eight inch yeah, caliper that right. they're defining a significant mature tree. Right. Uh, the uh, and then the violation penalties section, the city attorney recommended that we take that out. It would be part of the zoning ordinance, and we could we would enforce it based on the penalties that we do as any other ordinance. Uh, so that was suggested. Um, and then the rec this is this is something as we've heard from Roger recommendations in a zoning ordinance. He um, frowns upon it frowns that. upon that. <laughs> Um, because there's it no teeth his and there's, brow. yeah, it's nothing that can be enforced. It, it wouldn't hurt to be in there, but um, nonetheless, that was his recommendation. And then just the, the added cost to residents now that we're going to have to have those surveyed and showed on a on a survey as part of a building permit. It does add some cost to the the plans that are submitted as as part of a building permit. Well, one of the things that I thought was interesting is it a noteworthy omission is it does not cover any anything you do with trees on your property if you're not doing anything to the building on your property. So if you have a house and you can go out and cut down a nice tree in your yard if you want. Right, and that and that was on purpose. I mean that that may be at some point where we want to go, but Yeah, we didn't, kind of, we didn't think that that was, you know, this is it's not I don't want to say baby steps, but this is something that would at least catch the new builds and things. However, with not not necessarily going after the property rights on those other pieces as well. Yeah, and I think most of the time people want to keep trees if they're not doing something with the property that they have to get them out of the way for. So. Yeah. Well, I would also argue that there's a certain amount of peer pressure. When you're living there and you yeah. are surrounded by your neighbors, you're probably going to want to have a good reason to take down a tree. When you're a builder putting up a house right. and yeah. you're going to be gone, right. you don't really care exactly. as much exactly. what those people think about the trees that you just took down. And, and I also, you know, especially some spec homes, I wonder if the new owners actually realized the trees that yeah. were taken down before, you know, their house was built. If they like that it's clear cut, I don't, you know, versus many that may be there before. Commissioner Grable. Commissioner Forrest and I were wondering what are the penalties? <laughs> It would be a violation of the ordinance, and we would require them to plant trees, you know, as as prescribed here. Whether if it's going to be two for one. Um. So the city but, issues a, a, a what a mandatory injunction, and you must plant trees. I think you probably have to go get judicial assistance. We would a yeah, violation of the zoning ordinance. We turn over to the city I mean, attorney. I guess you and, can pursue it either through criminal prosecution or through some civil yeah. injunctive relief. But well, I, I suppose I the threat of it, you could say, you got to plan them or we're going to go get an order to require right. you. To I, I tend to agree with the city attorney that we shouldn't make this a criminal deal, uh, but maybe a bigger financial penalty might be nice. Well, I like yeah, I think what as, he oppo as, opposed to trying to, as opposed to having to go through a court process to require somebody to put up to plant another tree. Well, I think what he was saying is you, we don't have the authority to levy fines against people. We, we can't. Construction management plan. Well, what we've done then is is um, we've done the escrow, and then we've had right. them. So that, you know, I suppose that's a potential is we could include this within the escrow and then tap out of the escrow that's to kind of plant the trees there, if people don't. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Forrest. Well, when I looked through this, and I think I saw a version of the lettering was a little bit different, but um, I'm, I'm really, really pleased that you've taken the time to do this because it's, I, we need to um, move on this. We've been talking about it for years. Um, I, one thing was uh, the definition of the um, significant tree. I, it would be nice to use the um, American Association of Nurserymen standard where they define caliper in a certain way. Um, 
and so that we're consistent with that. I think it's in there now, isn't it? Yeah, it could be. Thank you. <laughs> I, I saw put, an earlier version. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I That's think good. I think I got okay. that added. Well, for the diameter breast height measurement, I think. Yeah. It's good. And oh, I'm just, no. Go ahead. Well, then um, the part about replacement trees be um, varied by species it's kind of like well how many of one species can you have versus whatever and a lot of this isn't necessarily a problem with it but it's because I, and that's a very good point so that you don't have a whole row of the same tree dying out but um, is it varied by co considering what's already there or is it um, can you have two of one three of another or um, where does that limitation come in and I'm not sure it needs to be more closely defined. These are just things that hit my brain at the time. Yeah, I would, does it need to be, you know, mm -hmm. people can, as long as they're within this, they should be able to do what they want. And then is there anything specific about, I'll, I'll wrap yeah, up here. Is there anything specific about how these trees, mature trees, should be protected and whatever? Otherwise, is there, we would want to work on an educational component for the city to have some kind of a handout or website or something to say, you know, this is how you protect a tree. Yeah, or, isn't or there something in the construction management plan for protecting the trees? That's what I, I forgot to go back and look, mm -hmm. but I, I remember seeing yeah, some. Yeah, I believe there is. So that's what I referenced in here, and maybe okay, we need good. to go back and look at what really is there. And maybe this got changed too, the part about no person in control of such work. Um, is there a possibility for an argument as to who's in control, the owner, the contractor, who's ultimately responsible? Yeah, we went back and said the permit holder is responsible. Okay, so whoever's on that permit. And I like yeah. the, the definite date of um, being determined by when the um, applications were submitted. That was nice. Yeah, I think on that point, so we said if, so if somebody clear cuts a, a lot a year before it's applied for the permit, this still applies. So in other words, can't have the previous owner right, knock trying, everything down and then buy trying it. Trying to prevent somebody from yeah. gaming the system. Commissioner Grable. I assume that caliper means diameter. Mm -hmm. uh, on the definition section, uh, it's a little bit ambiguous. I think you ought to say that a removable tree, a removable tree is not a significant, the definition of significant mature tree does not include removable trees. Sure. Because I think it's not just an ambiguity there. So a tree that's roughly 15 inches in diameter or in circumference is a significant mature tree. As long as it's one of these species. Yeah. yeah. Commissioner Shearer and then Commissioner Schroeder. Um, I'm, try I'm frantically trying to think of our code. I, I don't recall anywhere where we have a good definition of preservation easement. And I'm wondering if that should be included in the definitions. Since we're offering it as an either or, I would want people to be very clear about what it entails. Yeah, that was, I, yeah. I think I mentioned that maybe in my note to carry what, what that is. Yeah. I, I just would want us to be yeah. clear for and, people. And to, to Roger's point, if it's not a requirement, is there a way, what did you say about the conservation easement, something, an option to do? I don't, you know, I don't know how you put it. I think it's good to have in here somehow, even oh, though it's too. not required. But a lot of people have actually used oh. or seem to have used that as, as a tool to uh, address other Instead things. Instead of using the phrase recommendations, but an example of whatever we're talking about. Examples yeah, so that, I mean, worded. you can illustrate your code with diagrams and examples and things, but I can see where recommendations is a little bit more if you put it out there as an easy to understand definitional option, I think people are more likely to look at it, honestly, as a, as a possibility. And then one other thing, this might be a little nitpicky, but in section six, um, where we're starting to define what the replacement trees would be, A and B, I guess mostly, um, you know, I'm, I'm remembering when elms were coming down all over town, and we would have had elms in 2B at that part of our lives. But then re disease resistant elm trees were developed and we, we moved through the elm crisis. Um, right now um, we're in the ash crisis, although I understand disease resistant ashes are being developed. And 
so I, I, I wonder when we use the phrase known disease epidemic, if we need to have any reference to disease resistant varieties of any of those trees or clarify that. Yeah, if that someone really likes the, the profile of a particular tree and they can find a disease resistant variety, would, would we allow that, for example? So you'd say unless. I don't know how to do it. Must be subject to known disease ep epidemic except if a dis disease an, resistant an, strain an accepted is. Accepted disease resistant strain so, yeah, or something. something. Like that. Yeah. That makes sense. Question? Commissioner Grable. Why do you allow removable, uh, excuse me, removal without replacement? Um, where the tree being removed is within 10 feet around a new building. I mean, isn't that, isn't that the problem with these things is people come in, uh, they, don't, they don't come in and clear cut a lot, they build a new house and they take down the trees that are, in, that are close to that area and they're not clear cutting the rest of the lot. Why not require replacement of all trees that are removed in a rebuilding or remodeling situation? We could. <laughs> is there a so, concern that they're not going to survive if it's within well, 10 the, feet? Well, their the concern is within 10 feet that they're not going to survive. You don't have to replace them within that 10 feet. Right. So, but oh, if I a see. tree is within that area, you've got to take it down because you're, you're going to build there. Fine, you but put you replace one. it someplace else. If that's what people want to do. It, that's what I want. That's do. what you want to do. <laughs> I'm not opposed to that. I just didn't quite go that far yet. Okay. So I mean, that's certainly a option to look at. Commissioner Schroeder, I got. I have a few comments, but first of all, I'm I'm pleased we're at the point where we're actually considering this because we've talked about it for a long time, and it is a part of our comprehensive plan, if I recall. Um, I, I'm just going to go through a few points. I think that there are additional significant trees that we could add to this list. Um, we've, this list focuses on native things. We leave out things like Scots pine or Austrian yeah, pine, that, that, which are frequently planted and worthy trees. And just because they're introduced from other places doesn't mean we shouldn't be <coughs> perpetuating them. When you look at removable trees, we may not ever want to replant a cottonwood, but a cottonwood is significant in terms of the canopy or the aesthetic effect it has in a neighborhood. So. We wouldn't, in, in this case, we wouldn't be counting that necessary for replacement, but I think we should, if I understand this correct. We're allowed to remove a silver maple or a cottonwood, even though it could be the largest tree on the block, and not have to replace it. And I think we should have to replace it, maybe just not with a silver maple or cottonwood. Um, in number four, we talk about um, the survey that's done. We say located by species their diameter and approximate height. Tree surveys are oftentimes identified with a diameter that is the, the DBH that's listed in the, in the, um, in, under the definition for significant mature tree. But what's often deceiving on a tree survey or any kind of a survey is that surveyors use a symbol for a tree that would suggest it's about four feet across even though the true canopy might be closer to 30 or 40 feet. Mm -hmm. And it would be useful to us in reviewing a plan to understand how broad that canopy is and what it's impacting and how we actually work in the area below the canopy. So I think in addition to just saying diameter, I think in that case you mean caliper, but I think we also want to try and get a sense of the canopy, the size of the canopy of the tree. And if they're out there doing a survey, it's an easy thing. It's not, trees aren't perfectly circular, but you could generalize the, the, the size of the tree. In 6A, I'm, I'm not convinced we have to vary by species. If we take down one oak, would we have to put, down, put back one oak and one maple? Would really, we have some neighborhoods where oaks predominate and we should be replanting all oaks. Um, I think the, 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 there are two other points. In, in number 10, when we talk about tree protection as subject to the city's construction management plan, um, every tree and every condition and every construction site is different and it would be hard to generalize in a, in a general city policy with the best way to protect a tree on a given site. And it might be better that if we're going to the point of actually requiring someone to identify a tree that should be saved, we should be specific about the methods that 
whatever inspector who's out on the site will be using to judge whether they're protecting it the right way, to find what those measures are, have our city forester review that as part of the plan, say that that either is or isn't a good measure of protection. And there's lots of ways to protect trees. Most often they're simple. They don't always require staying away from them. And then the last part relative to the violations. It seems to me that we could identify any number of financial penalties, but the largest penalty would be the city not granting a certificate of occupancy. Somebody's building a home, they want to move in, they don't replace the tree that they're required to, they don't move in. It seems to be pretty significant to me. <coughs> That's it. I think it's a, a great start. <laughs> Seems to be a your last meeting. <laughs> <laughs> trying to catch up for all those years. <laughs> There's a rash of agreement breaking out here. Um, so I'd say so. Carrie, does that you know what stated here tonight? I'd have a couple of comments. I was going to send you too, but is that enough to? I was just going to ask if you've got a good running inventory of the. The outbreak of agreement here on various I've items. got a lot of it written down, but I okay. always have the tape I can go back to and watch okay. again. <laughs> and then you had some other ones? Like yeah, I, uh, and, and actually uh, talking to somebody, I was thinking about replacing significant mature tree with just protected trees oh, to kind of make that a little simpler, possibly. Um, so that was, that was one of them. And then um, just, and we kind of talked about the removable tree, just under a removable tree, it's really any tree that's not called a protected tree and I'm you know however you want to word it if you want to say you would need to replace some of those too that's fine and then uh, yeah so that was the the bigger ones that I that I had on here and I, I like this um, enforcement it seems like the couple of things we've touched on is one <clears throat> the extent to which this can be part of the escrow deal with the demolition and then this the very simple straightforward mm -hmm. certificate, of, certificate of occupancy is is an awfully nice carrot to encourage somebody yeah. to get the job done I'd, I'd Commissioner Scheer I just wanted to uh, ask for some clarification from Commissioner Schroeder so your your theory on section 2b and the repla well, and, and then 6A and B, is that we look at a, the size of a tree as opposed to its variety. And if it is above whatever our caliper standards are that, or whatever our selected diameter, that they would, any, anything removed that, at that size is subject to the replacement qualifications. I'm, I'm kind of looking at it from the parameters we, that have been defined under the purpose. We talk about protecting tree canopy, and mm -hmm. cottonwoods would have huge canopy. Um, if you look at um, some of the environmental benefits of shading or stormwater management, stormwater enhancements, um, or even just general aesthetics of a neighborhood, cottonwoods aren't always a bad tree in a neighborhood. Okay. Um, but if we don't, if, if we allow them to be removed without being replaced, we lose that opportunity mm -hmm. for replacing something that offers significant aesthetic and environmental benefits to the neighborhood. And I just want to, I just think we should. Um, get that back in, even if it's not replaced in kind um, with another cottonwood, for instance. I, I like that theory. Any significant mature large tree like that is a loss yeah. if it has to go. So it, any of those would need a replacement then, right? I'm just bringing this up. Should it be one for one for those? Because, you know, you're, you're, you're already saying it can be removed fine, but, you know, the... The other places where you want a two for one is more of a penalty to remove it. I'm just bringing that up if it's a one for one for those. I think there's an interesting debate here because mm -hmm. what we're interested in is the perpetuation of a canopy. And so we need to be looking at this over not a site plan and construction period, but over generations of people living in Edina. And you could look at it, we shouldn't be penalizing people for removing a tree that's, that's necessary or desirable by requiring the plant too. But the additional incremental cost of a second tree is not all that much. And there is the chance that over the generations of people living in Edina, one of those trees will fail. And we'll still have one left if you go for two for one. I wouldn't see a two for one replacement as being onerous or uh, 
or punitive. I think it's looking in the long-term benefits of our community. Question. Commissioner Forrest. Okay, this is just my hypothetical is what, what um, if you're on a smaller lot and you're replacing, you know, there's a single large tree that gets replaced, um, two for one, it, you're, first you're talking about a significant size replacement tree, which is expensive. But also it may be, I mean, you don't want to be plant, trying to cram two trees into a space that there isn't room for the uh, two mature trees to be there there's on a, a smaller lot. There's a provision for that. Yeah, it's a, in there. It could be relocated, could be located in another public piece of property yeah. or you're not required to replace an oak with an oak. You could be replacing an oak with an ironwood. And would but what if you'd rather have one oak than two ironwoods? Yeah, I mean, you know, there is something to be said about uh, about like that, poker. too. It's like, oh, well, I have to have two trees, so I'm going to do two columnar trees instead of one with a big canopy. My guess is we have a variance process for that, right? Here we go. <laughs> these smaller lots, they, they throw these monkey wrenches in. Well, I, I think that's an excellent um, start on this. Um, mm -hmm. Mike, you and Claudia, thank you for getting the ball rolling and nice work on that first draft. And Carrie, thanks for running it through. Um, staff, I think maybe what we should do is get another version of this. If you can try and do a revision based on the comments that we've made. A lot of stuff for you guys to I, I think bring it back and we can have one more look at it to see if it's getting where we think it's ready to be unveiled. And then Obviously, before this can move along, we'd have to do a public hearing, and, um, and I'd like to, you know, engage people on that. So, very good. Anything else on this issue? Let's say so. You're so you're saying we should look at it. Would it be next meeting we look at it, and then? Yeah, I'd be good with. Then a public look, hearing. Does that work for you, Carrie? Um, I'm when sorry, is, I didn't catch that. When so is the I, next meeting? So the twenty. So this would be second? updated at the next meeting, and then. We have comments, and then the next meeting after that will be a public hearing on it. We, by statute, you don't have to hold a public hearing. We have on most zoning ordinance items, but um, we can. Well, do we? Well, oh, well, we don't have to have a public hearing. We have to. It has you to have go to make recommendations, right. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I think a public hearing is a good idea. Um, you know, this is a. We think it's a good idea, but I'd like to hear if people have arguments for why they think it's not. And I also think, you know, I think this is a, you know, we're, we're talking about an ordinance that is going to affect only properties where there are construction changes happening, demolition or construction. We're not, you know, we're not going beyond that. Um, but I, I just think it's smart of us to do a public hearing on it. Yeah, yeah. And before we do that, I'd like to get a good handle on the staffing impacts okay. of, of this. I'd like to have that answered so, so we, you, we know that answer. Is it reasonable to get us a revised version back at our meeting on the 22nd? Um, I'm going to be on vacation for a week starting <laughs> uh, soon. <laughs> so I, we can, I, I think I can get a version together for more discussion on the 22nd yeah. you know we may want to take another look at it even after that before we schedule the so then we could decide on the 22nd when we set it for a public yeah. hearing what kind of lead time do we need for public hearing notice uh 10 day advance and so we papers, could so. if we decided well we might need to wait two meetings but probably the we could certainly meeting. do one of the meetings in february yep okay Does i have work? a yeah i just have a comment on you know there's a lot of tree ordinances out there and a couple of them required you need city approval to trim your trees. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> some, they must have a couple full-time foresters in those in those cities. Get a lot of calls. Okay, very good. Um, so let's leave that item, and Carrie will look forward to your next version. So then the next item up is um, the subdivision ordinance. Gary, you want to walk us through what you're what you're proposing here? Okay, this one has come to it. So the purpose here is just to introduce and get a discussion started on this uh, an amendment to the subdivision ordinance. 
This comes to us as a result of the recent subdivisions we've had, the Blackfoot Pass and the um, subdivision in Rolling Green, <clears throat> and then also our minimum lot size requirements for, for some of our oversized lots. So the ordinance before you is intended to accomplish a couple of things. First is to get our, our standards in order in regard to subdivision. You recall that we, we struggled with the subjective criteria in granting a subdivision. Um, so what's, been rec what's recommended here is to not eliminate that criteria but shift it into the provisions that we can, cons we can consider that criteria as part of a variance, neighborhood character, things like that. Um, <clears throat> the city attorney has advised that we should take out of the subdivision ordinance the minimum lot size requirements that that belongs in the zoning. So the first part of this ordinance is kind of that housekeeping, shifting those standards around. And the second piece is trying to get a handle on the minimum lot size requirement. So I've offered, or just introducing to throw out for discussion, a couple of ways that we could go about the minimum lot size requirement. So as you know, currently the minimum lot size is established by the median of all properties within 500 feet of a subject property. So I've provided a couple of little different slants on that same provision. The first is, you recall the Blackfoot Pass where we had a distinct different neighborhood or different plats just to the east of that, um, this is a, a diagram of the median that we looked at. You see the dashed line that circles the, the, uh, the property in question. And to the east, we had those two plats that were very distinct from the, the subject property. So what if we drafted the ordinance to exclude completely separate plats, different from the original plat? And so I did an exercise in just comparing some of our recent subdivisions to find out what would have happened if that were the code requirement. So if we eliminated those two plats and just considered the uh, properties within the plat that the subject property was located on, the median would have changed and this plat would have required a variance. Um, so again, we could get into the neighborhood character and those kinds of things. Um, they would have needed variances both for the lot area and lot width. Um, that chart on page one of the, the memo that I attached in your packet indicates what the medians would be. So you see there would have been four variances requested or required for that plat. I then ran that same calculation on the, the Hawks Terrace and Tracy Avenue subdivision. Um, there was no change. You can see the, the, the red X's are the, the different plats that were uh, platted at a different time. We would have just looked at that plat that's highlighted in yellow. The minimum standards would have changed. The minimum uh, lot size requirement would have been smaller, but they still would have required variances. Um, so no change to that plat. Um, with the Merrill Lane project, this was all plat platted under the Rolling Green uh, subdivision, so there would not have been any change to that subdivision. The next option that I looked at was shrinking down the median to 250 feet. And again, I ran these same plats, so the circle got much smaller. You see the red X's indicate all the properties that would have been eliminated as part of the median calculation. So with the Blackfoot Pass subdivision, there would not have been a change. The, the properties still would have met the medians. And again, that's because of those, those plats to the right of the subject property that some of those lots did abut that site. But they were quite a bit smaller, so there would have been no change if we reduced our median to 250 feet. Uh, the same was true for the Tracy Avenue plat. Um, there would have been no change and also no change in the rolling green um, subdivision as well. So I just throw those alternatives out for discussion and kind of the, um, along the same lines as the landscape ordinance, just open it up for discussion and we can proceed from there. Thanks, Carrie. Comments? Commissioner Forrest. 
Well, at first glance, and I'm not saying I won't come around as the discussion goes on, but my first um, impression is that I like the idea of, of considering whether or not a property is part of a neighborhood that, as it was platted originally or not, so that those things are clear during the process. Um, so I, I kind of lean that way versus shrinking down to the 250 feet or and if it's an either or. And then I'm wondering if it would be helpful to have a, a clear definition of plat because it's kind of a platted neighborhood. Um, and are there properties that would not fall under that definition? I mean, under the way it's used right now um, not, as not part of any platted neighborhood. Yeah, Roger, the city attorney, shared that same concern, just how uh, how can we clearly define that um, so that, that is an issue that we would have to if we go this route. Right, um, the, the example we had on Blackfoot Pass is easy to see because there's this straight line and it's you can tell it's very different, but it won't always look right. that easy. Like the one you drew up on Tracy, I thought was interesting because it didn't, I would not have guessed that that was a different plat. I mean, I guess the rectangular, I don't know, I just, and I, and what are we, are we basing it on when a plat was, I assume when a plat was filed, so when a subdivision was created. I remember we had that one over near Southview Middle School where there was the edge of a really huge subdivision. There was uh, the, uh, the one in Indian Hills more recently and the one near Southview Middle School. Other than that, in all the years I've been here, the rest, I mean, when I look at this one on Tracy, you know, it's still the neighborhood character. Just because right. it was built in a couple different phases doesn't change that. So that's the problem here of bo going just strictly on the plat thing. It's like most of the plats probably, you know, but but we, you know, like the Indian Hills, it's so clear. A ridge, there's a physical ridge, there's a different time period, a different development style. The problem is, I'm sure our city attorney said, will say, we can't use common sense in any of this. <laughs> it, it's got to be, it's got to be, you know, a rule that, that, and that's the trouble we get into every time. It's like as soon as you can't have any, you know, common sense look at it, then it, because I'm almost afraid, <laughs> but if you strictly go by the plat, I think we'll make just as many mistakes the other way. I don't know. I, I, I tend to agree. I like the idea of restricting it to the plat because those lots were put that way, and that's really what the lots ought to be judged against, what the way it was drawn up. You know, I think we made a terrible mistake on that thing near Southdale because we allowed those bigger lots in the other in the other subdivision to control what happened with that particular lot. It just Which one was this? The, near the Southview. One, one near excuse me, Southview. Yeah. You know, there were big lots across the street on a different plat and that affected what everybody was willing to do with respect to the lot that was clearly in line with all the lots, yeah. all the other lots in that particular subdivision plat. And uh, it just seems to me to be, me to be much clearer if you restrict it to what's been platted. If a lot's in a subdivision plat, that's what controls the median. I, I don't think I'm in favor of the plats for a couple of reasons. I think it, keeps us too much in the past maybe and doesn't acknowledge the things that have changed. I know there's neighborhood character, but it, how, again, backing that question of how do you define a plat, what, what's more relevant than another one? And what's interesting when I, you think about all the 100-foot uh, lots here that have came before us that people want to subdivide, well, if you look at the plat, they're always 50 feet. So. Or is that what we're saying when you use a plat that we go back to that, then we should approve every 100 foot to 50 foot because there was originally platted as a 50 foot. So I, I have a tough time with the plat. I, I would be more in favor of the 250. I mean, that is more the immediate area myself. 
that could really skew it, but at the same so kind of plat in a lot of ways. That's my two cents on it. Commissioner Forrest. I think I think that for me the platted neighborhoods it gives at least a, the guidance toward honoring neighborhood character is a little closer than 250 feet. There was a property down in like Wooddale and 58th or something like that at one point that was being considered um, for subdividing mm -hmm. and all the houses it was a very long wide lot on a street that had large lots and but immediately behind that house and for several blocks there were all these 50 foot lots mm -hmm. and so That's that house one we're talking about. No, no, this no, is one that never came before us, but it was it came it was pulled mm -hmm. and it uh, that one clearly if you use the even the 250 you would have been um, Probably dividing that one and there was a lot of neighborhood uproar against yeah, that as well I remember sitting in my kitchen going, there is no way <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. It was like in Woodcrest. Yeah. 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 yeah, all right Commissioner sure it's like old home week here if we're remembering. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we are going through this exercise because the city council instructed us to do this? Uh, the city council instructed us on the getting the standards in line. But there's been discussion by the planning commission that we take a look at this, and the council has alluded to it as well. There wasn't a specific direction from the council that we have to change the median. As I'm sitting here listening to everybody talk, I, I'm, and I'm entering my ninth year at this, so I'm sort of the old home week thing, thinking back about examples. There aren't that many, really. And I, I don't like the idea of authoring something that I can, I can argue different pros and cons on both of these proposals. Uh, I can think of things that are gonna go very amok if we adopt one or the other. It, it, there's a part of me that thinks maybe this isn't something that needs to be changed in order to be dealt with. We just continue with the variance process. Um, there, there may be more negatives than positives by doing this. If, if we would do that, I, I wouldn't have a problem with doing that, but I think we need to relax then the requirements for a variance because merely because a lot is a hundred feet wide in an area of 50 foot lots does not meet any variance requirement. So we're stuck. So you got to have some more flexibility than what we would have technically right now with well, respect to variances. We've granted variances in that situation. Yeah. But I think we're stretching know, we gotta to find the We've got to stand on our heads to do it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Because I would do it. They can, <laughs> yeah, you've done it. <laughs> but, but see, and that's, that's the one well, thing I like about changing this ordinance, or at least addressing it in some way. And like I said, I'm still open to, you know, I'm still trying to be open-minded on this. I'm still leaning toward the platted thing, because what provides the residents the most uh, assurance that they can look at a property that they're purchasing or that they're living on and have some idea as to what might be happening happening to the neighbor next door. Whereas if you're you're doing the 250 or, or 500, it uh, it it can be really a, you know kind of a crapshoot because if you're near another neighborhood with different sized lots, and then you're then you're subject to the all these subjective um, matters and that we sometimes consider with our variance process. So. Well, I, I mean, I can't help but just remember that I, I mean, I think we keep having these subdivision variances used as a, as a way to combat the house that people don't want to go on the lot. I mean, it's, it, our regulations about setbacks and height and the rest of it is what we're supposed to be using to regulate how a house fits in the lot I mean I guess you can there are some extreme examples where you know putting two houses where one is but I kind of I kind of feel like Commissioner sure that we we can navigate our way to the right answer in specific situations and I worry that we'll create just as much trouble with the different plats and the the 250 seems just as arbitrary as the 500 
I guess my response to that would be that, you know, it's, it's, I would say that sometimes it's an objection to a house, but I think very often it's more so an objection to two houses that are both too large for, you know, compared to the other homes in, in the neighborhood. Yes, but, but, the, but, but the lot next but, door, so you right. have the 100-foot lot that somebody wants to divide into two 50-foot lots, and the neighbors on 50-foot lots are upset with that because they don't mm -hmm. like the house that's going to go on. But they can get that tonight, and then the next day build exactly that same house on their lot that's oh, just as big as the house I mean. that they I mean, didn't want built on that, which is why I don't think we should have the subdivisions being what we're trying to use to regulate the concern, kind of houses. That you know, if, if that's what we want as a city, fine. If not, then let's find some way of going against it without this, this wishy-washy, well, we use a variance process when really they don't have a hardship. They can build a house on their lot, period. You know, it's, it's, it's so... But, it's, it's not a hardship to have a lot that's too large. You can do what every, everybody else in your well, neighborhood can do. Well, and hardship isn't a test anymore, so. <laughs> um, it, it's not a practical difficulty to have a, a lot that's too large, other than mowing and snow removal. But the, um, it, it's like, let's, let's be clear to our residents as far as, are we going to allow this or not going to allow this, and instead of putting it on the whims of whoever shows up on the night of variances coming before us. Commissioner Fisher. I don't have the answer here, but I, 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 don't, I, I, I do worry that um, here's what we're dealing with. The, the people that are really good about out there, the, you know, they're, like, they're, they're prospecting, right, for, for financial opportunity. They're using GIS programs, and it goes around. And, and that's why we're seeing lots that miraculously are right on the edge of another subdivision. So they're taking advantage of the 500-foot um, uh, circle and and they're you know I, I just keep going back to the Indian Hills one because it was like oh my god this is so obvious and yet I can see if we change the rules we're gonna have some create some new problems that we're not even imagining now and I'm just wondering I keep thinking about remember back when we just struggled like crazy with um, what was it the one foot yeah, oh, and, and we, we kind of started talking about conditional use rather than, you know, as of right kind of stuff, and, and it allowed us just a little bit more control here. Is there a way that you can say we stick with the 500-foot radius, but we, when your property that you want to subdivide is literally physically sitting on the edge or within 100 feet of a different plat or subdivision, that it requires one other layer of review or something. I don't know what the something is, but it, it sort of sets it apart. It says, wait a minute, <laughs> what's going on here? Because generally, you know, that if, if, you know, if you're not gobbling up too much of another plat or another subdivision, it's, it's going to kind of even itself out. It's just when you're right on the edge and you're able to gain all the benefit of that smaller subdivision or bigger or whatever the case is, um, so I don't know. I, I don't know if there's a creative way to do that. That's sort of it's, that's our rule. It's the way we look at it. Uh, it might just help us on those on those conditions because I, I think otherwise it's working fine. You know, it's just those one out of twenty that we get. I mean, it just feels, for the residents that live around there, it feels like it's a big problem that exists. What's that? Yeah. Perhaps one or two. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think we, I mean, that's kind of what a variance process, I, I mean, I'm intrigued by that possibility, but it starts to sound too Rube Goldberg to me. You know, it's just too many bank shots and and just trying to explain to somebody how they would, <laughs> and I think we've, I, you know, the, the, the profile gets raised on these things and, you know, people have to stare them down and I think for the most part we've done okay with figuring out the right answer on these variances on the subdivision side. I mean, I, I, I'm fine going along the way we are. I'll vote no at the Planning Commission. It'll go to the council where the city attorney is sitting there, and he'll tell them you can't vote no, and they'll just vote yes. And be well, they, they're getting rid of the language that you all relied on and, uh, <laughs> in creatively voting no. Um, well, I can be creative 
in many ways. <laughs> we haven't tested it yet. How's that for feedback? I'm hearing move forward with the standards and leave the median alone for now. Just leave the leave the kind of figuring out how to determine whether it needs a variance or not right. as is. In a lot of the discussion that you were having on the 50 foot lots, this wouldn't address that anyway because 9,000 square feet and 75 are the minimum. So you'd need a variance for those. No yeah, what. that's a whole different story <laughs> about having a 75 foot. Well, having our 75 foot minimums when there's so many lots in town that have 50 foot frontage, it's just. Mm. Yeah. Create some multiple R zones. <coughs> Any further uh, collective intelligence on this? <laughs> so our recommendation. I'm not sure what our recommendation. I don't sense a, a, a majority appetite for some silver bullet. What, what's funny about it, and I, and, and I think it's perfectly fine, is that when we get frustrated, we're in these meetings, inevitably we're like, we need to really we need take to a fix look that. <laughs> at these ordinances. <laughs> and maybe that's a good thing to be able to say once in a while. It's like, it turns you know. out it's hard. It turns out it's hard to write an ordinance that fits every single situation. Is there any, um, are there any examples of other similar types of suburban communities, whether in Illinois or whatever, that have tackled this problem? I can't think of another city that has a median. Usually it's a straight number. That's your minimum lot size. I've, right. Yeah, I'm and, sure there, there might be some out there. I'm not aware of them. But it's, part of it is the beauty of, of where we live, honestly. But, we but have I mean, such a lot of these Chicago suburbs have the same neighborhoods. thing. Yeah. You know, where a lot of the suburban communities that have these rules, it's all the same. No, I'm talking about like the older suburbs around Chicago that have faced the same teardown issues that we have. Um, have they dealt with subdivisions or do they just flat out say no? Or, well, what the problem is, you know, is in the teardown, any... they're dealing with them in zoning, setback, bulk regulations as opposed to subdivisions. I mean, again, it's using... I think this is the wrong tool well, for what we're trying to deal with. They use neighborhoods, though, and they use identifiable zones and things, and sometimes right, they use overlay districts. But I, I, I'm, not, I'm not averse to necessarily subdividing um, lots. You know, it's, it's kind of if it's appropriate for the neighborhood. But I just I think it needs to be clear w so that people can look at our ordinance and have some idea as far as how is this likely to play out? Because we have somebody come before us and say, I was told when I bought my house nobody would build there, so I oriented my house in that direction. And, you know, because they weren't supposed to ever be able to build, so, but now they're coming before us. How is it going to play out? Well, I mean, I think if you really wanted to solve it, you'd come up with, you'd take a stab at well. trying to come up with different R zones. Because to Commissioner Fisher's point, I mean, that's, we have, we have Pamela Park, then we have Rolling Green. We have Indian Hills, then we have Morningside. We have, I mean, there, there, it's unusual for cities to have that wide a variation of lot sizes and shapes, and it is part of what gives the city great character, but if you're really going to try and be straightforward about it, you try and, you know, you try and create different zones for each of those and just have straightforward lot area width, depth, requirements but even that that would be just a I don't know if I'd survive that <laughs> think about drawing the lines there nope one one more house over no one more lot no one less lot no zigzag around that lot L lot size aside how do we how do we <laughs> no, we have neighborhood <laughs> character thrown all over the place in our comprehensive plan and yet we have no way of really addressing that in our code so well, sure you do. Just... Sure you do. You have lots of ways. I think what the city attorney is saying is it can't just be what you what you think it is or what but, but it, Fisher Shearer but that's thinks it is or pretty much what, I think what it, it is. is. I'm not talking about lot size. Lot size aside, we have neighborhood character out there. And, it, this, you know, and our state law on, on variances has the words neighborhood character, and it's not defined anywhere. So, you know, we're we're kind of facing that issue as well. How are we in Edina 
protecting this neighborhood character we splashed all throughout the comprehensive plan. How are we approaching that? That's Through what height I'm limitations and, and setbacks, front yard and, setbacks, and all side those front yard, yard setbacks, setbacks and height limitations ordinance. are based only Tree on ordinance. lot size. Then is that what you're saying? No, they're they're based on the boundaries of you know no, your exactly. Setbacks but are. how does that that fit in with the neighborhood character? That's that's what I mean. How well, how, you can't build how, you can't build a house bigger and closer to the lots than. We I'm not talking about setbacks and things like that. I'm just talking about character, well, the subjective is, side I, of it. See, I don't exactly. When you were when you were working on the comp plan committee, what did you envision as a neighborhood character? Was it the fact they had side, sidewalks and tree-lined streets, or that the houses were post World War II bungalows, or what? You know, how did you envision protecting? What were you trying to protect when you said we want to protect neighborhood character? That's what I want to know. And if there's something that we can identify, then how can we work to protect it? That's, I mean, the ambiguity is, it's like it's all talk and, and nothing substantive to hang our hats on. Okay, speech over. <laughs> all right, so here's, what, here's what I, I figured out. The problem we have is better than the problem we might create. There you go. That's my concern. That's good. So far. <laughs> All right. Well, so I I sense a lack of an appetite to make um, to make these changes, and so um, I don't know procedurally where where did you want to go with this? <clears throat> We're still playing with the language a little bit, the city attorney. So I'd like to. Um, want to? I'll bring it back. At bring a, it back to us once right. you've um, kind of worked through that a little yep. bit. If you you know if there's some silver bullet that shows up on the drawing table someday. Bring it to us. Yeah, right. No, we're not doing any of us. Right. <laughs> Fail to vote to <laughs> deny. <laughs> All right. Anything else on that item? No. Okay. Um, so then we just uh, were to correspondence and petitions. There's the council connection, the attendance sheet, uh, and Carrie put together, Carrie and his staff put together a nice two-sided summary. I would have thought this would have been 30 or 40 pages, but <laughs> all of our work from last year, um, I like this kind of format. Um, Commissioner Potts had kind of suggested, is there one way we could collect in a single place kind of what we've been working on? And so now that I see this, I'd like... You know, Commissioner Grable and, and myself, we'd like to go back in history and see if we were better than That's right, we had, Chair Stock. We, we had many more. You yes, guys probably did. <laughs> well, this doesn't have the hours of the meetings either. <laughs> per hour, you guys were much more efficient. And single um, home so that's variances aren't listed. What's that? Variances aren't listed, you know, the single family homes. Ah, okay. So, so you, you, had, you did take a lot more action than just bigger what's projects. But I think it is a nice way to kind of keep track, and if we can do this as a running, uh, a running uh, summary, that's a, I think it provides nice context. Share it with the city council as well. Yeah. I'm particularly thinking of those that are going both ways, yeah, right. from approval to denial. I think, and we've got a couple of denial, approved motion failed. We'll get rid of that for next year. <laughs> Won't be any of those on the 2014 summary. Inside joke for any of you who've made it this far in the tape. <laughs> um, and then I did talk with um, Carrie on, we've been trying for some time to get an audience with the city attorney. Um, and we, we've decided with no, uh, uh, no intended offense to, to Commissioner Grable, who won't be with us by then, that... that um, that perhaps the, whoever the new commissioner who comes on to replace him will need a, uh, a, an indoctrination from the city attorney more than Commissioner Grable. So we're trying to aim for um, April? Yes. We talked about March several, several dates. Um, we talked about the March 26th or April 9th so regular meeting date. Either sides of spring break. Yep. 
um, which both of those dates the city attorney can attend. Okay. And we also talked about a Saturday morning, say 9 o'clock over at the Senior Center, something like that, for March 22nd or April 12th. And the city attorney can make both those dates, too. And so. I thought that might be an environment that would be a little more conducive to a give and take and question and answer, relaxed kind of. So I would guess that, I... Would that be open to the public? Sure. It would be. Sure. Commissioner okay. Grable, ex officio. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask the really hard questions. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know. Do people have a preference? Is this is this Saturday? Yeah. So did you say there was a, a March one on a Saturday? March twenty second. What do people think about that? Would that be a required meeting? Uh, these work <laughs> sessions have not been part of our attendance, right? Correct. I mean, I'd like to get as many people as can be there, but I think our our attendance requirements are burdensome enough without. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think that. <laughs> so should we set the 22nd? Does that work for everybody? I mean, as much as you can know right now, I get that some things are going to come up. We should yeah, let's do that. Okay. Okay, good. We'll do. Um, all right, so then the only other thing I'd add, um, again, my thanks to um, Commissioner Platter and Commissioner Carr. And we do have um, many other items on our 2014 um, work list, and I'll be getting around to talk to all of you about ways we can get ahead of those things. So, um, Commission member comments. Any updates from liaisons or other comments that people would like to share? Commissioner Shearer? Okay, no significant updates. Uh, staff comments. I have some 2013 statistics that I could throw out. Uh, building permit activity. We have our, we've tallied up our final numbers for 2013 and we had 127 new home permits applied for. So we set another record. That was 120 of those, 127 were teardown rebuilds, and seven were um, new homes built on vacant lots or permits applied for on vacant lots. Four of them were in the Parkwood Knolls area, and then three are on these smaller subdivisions that we've approved. Wow. And, and that doesn't include major remodels. 119 in the Morningside neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Is we did add the one, so that's helping. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thank you for that. Uh, all right. So that brings us to the final item on the agenda. I move that we adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. The meeting is adjourned.